one another this morning. As you make your way back to your seats, you'll find in the bulletin the scripture reading for this morning, if you would pull that out, and we will read together together from Romans chapter 5. I will read the light print, and if you would, respond to the congregation with the dark. This morning we read from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. When we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Let us continue to praise him for this morning for dying on the cross for our sins. You may be seated. Let's continue our singing. If you'll take your hymn books once again and turn to number 210. 210, we'll sing it together. Jesus paid it all.
Jesus of sin and death our chains, but he with blood our freedom bought. It was finished on the cross. It was finished on the cross. to the screen and we will sing the wonderful cross when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died.
for me that lonely night in Gethsemane. Jesus died my soul to save. Trust that again you can say that this morning that the Lord has saved your soul. And if not, think about what the Lord Jesus Christ can do in your life to remove the burden of sin. All right. If you pray with me this morning, we'll receive our offering. May I just remind you if you'd like to give towards the Wysan Fund, you can still do that. There was uh, about $6,900 came in last Sunday. What a blessing that was. And we've been able to already. Um, give that to Carol, or most of it at least, and uh, anyway, if you feel the, the Lord leading you to do that, just mark in there Wysan Fund or something, and we'll make sure it gets there, and again, we're giving everything to them, and uh, so if you want to do that, that would be a great way for us to be a blessing to them. Let's pray. Father, this morning again, what a joy to know that we can gather and come and be so thankful for the salvation that you provided in your Son. I would ask this morning as we respond in our offering that you would use this as a time in which we can bless your name even in our giving. I would pray, Father, that we might be able to even give towards Carol and her girls and their needs and the 
days that lie ahead, may it be a, a way that we can very practically come alongside them. And Lord, just may you be glorified even in that. Cause us to think about what we've sung about. Cause us to realize that um, you have provided salvation for us at the cost of your son. May you cause us to realize that that means that we owe you everything. May we respond in that way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Who am I, O oh God? Who am I, O oh God, Creator, that you would be mindful of me? You have drawn me near. You have called me your own. because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. me when I'm falling and you've 
told me who I am. I am yours. Who am I that the eyes that see my sin? Would look on me with love and watch me rise again. Who am I that the voice that calms the sea would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because. thankful to be his and to be the children of a savior turn your eyes to the screen and let's sing it together mighty to save
the hope of the nations. We look around, we're surrounded 16 flags every Sunday we come in. Sometimes they have changed because sometimes the missionaries we support change, but we have 16 flags hanging on the wall, I mean on from the ceiling. 16 nations that need to know the hope of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say it often, but when our missionaries are here, I'm reminded of it even more. I really do trust that you don't come in and, and just they become so much a part that you forget that really the purpose of them there is for you to pray and to be, and be, oh, look at that, and to be and praying for them to be saved, all right? Well, I, I apologize already for my voice. I trust that, well, you may be praying that it doesn't last out for the next 45 minutes, but uh, I'm hoping it does. I'm going to do my best to cough into my, into my elbow. My mother never taught me that. You know, she always said, son, cover your mouth. But now we've been taught, you know, you cough into your elbow. So, you know, when you leave today, I will have used the, uh, the sanitary stuff back there. And then if you want to shake my hand, fine. If not, you can just walk on by. And, um, but anyway, I, uh, I am glad that we can look to the Word of God. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 15 this morning. Again, great songs that remind us of the cross. Again, we're right in the Gospel of Mark. We're in the portion where, again, we're walking towards the, the hill of Golgotha. We're walking towards the cross. The trials have begun to take place. The, um, we are in the midst of the trial before Pilate and then also Herod. Two weeks ago, we looked at the six people who make up the scene. You remember that the Jewish leadership is there, the Sanhedrin. They had already made their decision. They had had a conference, chapter 15, 1, said that they got together and they made a consultation, just simply means they made a resolution, they passed the final verdict. They had to wait by Jewish law until the morning had come. Their, their illegal late night trial was not sufficient, and so they had to wait until the, the daybreak to be able to pass their final resolution. So you have the Jewish leadership. Then you'll see the crowd that's around. Again, that crowd that will eventually cry for Barabbas. We suggested that it's possible that crowd was there because they were already Barabbas supporters. It's possible that this crowd came to Pilate's uh, house, as it were, to the praetorium because they knew that Pilate's uh, normal course of action, his custom was to release a prisoner and it is possible that this crowd came because they wanted to try to be the first in line to yell out, we want Barabbas. And if that would be at all true, and I think it has some legitimacy to it, then no wonder it didn't take a whole lot for the Sanhedrin to convince the crowd to cry out. Then, of course, you have Pilate, the, the governor, as it were, this political leader, this, as he was, a lifelong politician more concerned about the next election than about truth. He will say over and over in all the gospel records, I find no fault, this just man. I mean, over and over, the, he washes his hands and all the rest of it. I mean, he wants nothing to do with this, with this false verdict of taking Jesus to the cross, and yet Pilate still gave in to all the peer pressure. He wasn't willing to stand up for truth, and so we see Pilate. We saw King Herod, Herod Agrippa, the grandson of Herod the Great, and here he was. He just wanted to, again, play around with Jesus. He just wanted to see a miracle. He didn't care about truth. He couldn't care about the, the uh, trial, supposedly, that was going on, and so we saw Herod. We saw, of course, Bar Abbas, the son of the father. Bar Abbas, Barabbas, that's what his name means. The son of the father, the son of his father. I kind of picture it in my own mind, whether I've come up with the right uh, scenario or not, I kind of picture Barabbas and his two buddies who were chained together, awaiting their own crucifixion, sitting in a jail cell somewhere and probably overhearing all of the the yelling of the crowd, and they were yelling the name Barabbas. I don't know about you, but if I was in prison and I was uh, ready to go to be uh, executed, and I would hear a crowd yelling my name, I would have expected it to mean that they were crying for my crucifixion. Maybe it was family members or those that I killed or whatever. But it wasn't that at all. It was rather just the opposite. The crowd said, release to us Barabbas and crucify Jesus. 
As I have suggested, I can't imagine what it must have been like for Barabbas to have had the jailer come and unlock his cell and say, Barabbas, you're free. Go. How must he have thought? What must have been some of the first thoughts that went through his mind? I don't know, but he had to have been thinking, me? Why me? And when he left behind his two companions in the rebel, in the rebellion, I wonder what they said to him. Well, then, of course, the key figure in all of it is Jesus. I mean, sometimes we become so familiar with portions of the Scripture that I think sometimes we almost miss the obvious. And here was Jesus standing there. I want to again read chapter 15, verses 1 to 15, and I want you to just again kind of get a sense of the, of the passage and the scene Mark writes, immediately in the morning the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him and said, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, it is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you, but Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner unto them, whomever they required, requested. And there was one named Barabbas, Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels, and they had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. The chief priests stirred up the crowd so that they would rather release Barabbas to them. And Pilate answered and said unto them again, What then do you want me to do with him who is called the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus, after he had scourged him, to be crucified. You know, again, if we would go back, we could look at the case presented. We basically looked at that a week ago, or two weeks ago, so we're not going to spend a lot of time just again remembering that as the Sanhedrin brought the case before Pilate, it was just trumped up charges. There was no truthfulness in anything they wanted to bring. That's why it says in verse 3, they kept bringing all kinds of accusations. They were trying to find anything that might interest Pilate's uh, desire to want to see this one killed. And they just kept going one thing after another after another. The case was pursued, and that's what I want to spend a little bit more time on today. And I want you to go to John chapter 18, if you would. John expands this scene quite a little bit over what Mark presents, and there's a little something in John's presentation that I, I want you to make sure you focus on as it relates to this matter <coughs> Excuse me, of the case being presented. In chapter 18 of John, at verse 25, 28, John writes, And then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early in the morning, but they themselves didn't go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. I mean, what a joke. Here they were, it was an absolutely illegal trial from the get-go, trumped up charges and all the rest of it, and yet they were worried about ceremonial uncleanness. See, sometimes you and I, we get so worried about offending our religious scruples that we forget that we are absolutely filthy before God. It wasn't just the Sanhedrin who had their ideas completely mixed up. Verse 29 said, Pilate went out unto them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? I, I find at least five times in this in this short passage from uh, 18, 28 down through 19, this man, this man, this man. Pilate said, why have you delivered this man to me? What do you bring about 
this man? They answered, well, if he weren't an evildoer, would we have delivered him to you? Isn't it interesting? They try to change the question. They don't really answer it. You try to divert attention. Pilate said, you take him and judge him according to your own law. And the Jews said to him, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And but that saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. And Pilate entered the praetorium and called to Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, Well, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you concerning this? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Here's the passage I want you to spend a little bit of time with me on. Verse 36 and 37, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate said, Oh, well, are you a king then? And Jesus said, You've rightly said that I am a king. For this cause I was born. For this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone is of, who is of the truth hears my voice. I need you to think with me just a little bit about verses 36 and 37 and how it relates to the fact of Jesus being the king of a kingdom. There are many people who would go to these verses and this is what they would say. See, Jesus never expected to be a king over a kingdom. All it means is, is that God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. See, that's what he's saying. My kingdom is not of this world. There's a major problem with that premise and that's this. It's wrong. What Jesus is saying is not that my kingdom won't be in this world. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. The way that Jesus said it, he said it like this, my kingdom does not emanate out of this world system. He never came to the world expecting the world to pronounce him king. Jesus did not say to Pilate, I'm not a king over a kingdom. That's not what he said. He said, Pilate, don't worry about it. You don't have any power over me because my kingdom doesn't come out of your power, out of Rome's power, or out of any human power. My kingdom comes from my Father. And there will be a day when my kingdom will be in the world, but it's not of the world. Does that make any sense? See, we have this idea that Jesus now has formed some spiritual kingdom as if somehow it's just this, the realm of salvation and there will never be a day when Jesus sits on a throne. I'm here to tell you, he will sit on a throne of his father David over the millennial kingdom. It will be a historical, geographical, literal, earthly kingdom. It's found in Revelation chapter 20. Jesus was not just saying, I'm just the king over some spiritual kingdom. And I want you to make sure you understand that because if you notice Jesus' answer was when he said to Pilate, when Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? He said, well, it's just like you said. I am the king. But see, it's not time for me to set up my kingdom. That's what he is saying. Look, if it was time for me to set up my kingdom, don't worry, my servants would have fought. If you want to see that fighting, you go to Revelation 19. It's not that Jesus won't come and establish his kingdom and do battle with the very armies of heaven, I mean, excuse me, armies of the earth. It's not that Jesus will not come on his stallion and execute judgment on all the armies of man as they have gathered into the valley of Megiddo, what we call the battle of Armageddon in this campaign of battles that will, that will be all over Israel, north and south, east and west for three and a half years, beginning in the middle of the tribulation. It's not that he won't someday fight, he just said it's not my time to fight now. That's why I constantly take you back to Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Don't ever forget those passages because it's very clear. God has a purpose in sending Messiah and that purpose was to establish him as his, as his anointed one over his kingdom at the end of those 490 years. There just happens to be a gap between 483, year 483 and year 484. Sometimes again we, we think that during this crucifixion Jesus somehow changed his, his, um, his purpose 
But Jesus is very clear. He said, look, this, the purpose I came has not been changed. You're right, I am a king, and that's what I was born for, and that's what I'm going to come to. And he said, Pilate, don't worry about it. You don't have any power over me. I said it, I believe, two weeks ago, and I may have even said it last week, that Jesus was not murdered. Jesus was not really killed in the sense that he was taken by the power of uh, humans and put on a cross. He died for one reason, and that was because he knew it was God's will, and he gave up his life. Man had no authority. I believe we ended two weeks ago with... The verse in 1 Corinthians, it says, if they had known he was the king of glory, they wouldn't have killed him. That's right, they wouldn't have. Because, see, they would have understood what they were doing, but they didn't understand it because Jesus came to die. It was an old, I say old, but, you know, 25 years ago or 30 years ago now, I think it's been that we sang a Christmas musical in Byron, Michigan. The title of the Christmas musical was Born to Die. I've always liked that phrase. He was born to die. That was the purpose of Daniel 9, the first 483 years. That was the purpose. Daniel's very clear. He, he led up to that point. Then it says, after the 69th week, Messiah will be cut off. Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and all these passages that relate to the prophecy of the cross. Well, in John, Pilate asks that ultimate question. I think one of the most penetrating questions, I think one of the most important questions ever raised in Scripture, ever come out of the mouth of a man, he said, what is truth? Notice he said that because Jesus just said, I will bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said, what is truth? We live in an interesting age, do we not? And again, don't misunderstand me. I mean, our age isn't a whole lot different than it ever has been, but it just seems like over the last 20 or 30 years, at least 40 or 50 years, there's been such a downplay to truth. We live in such a relativistic society. We live in a society where we're just supposed to let everybody live by their truth. Nobody's truth is supposed to be any truer than anybody else's truth. And you have your truth and I have my truth. And, and if, if you want to believe your truth, you're supposed to be able to. And I can believe my truth. And, and that's true to a point. I mean, we can't argue somebody into heaven. I mean, if somebody wants to believe a lie, that's okay. You can warn somebody and warn somebody about certain things. You can tell them they shouldn't do this or do that. And if they do, there's going to be these consequences. If they choose to do it, they suffer the consequences. But, see, at the end of the day, truth is just that. It's true. See, we have the Word of God, which is true. It is truth. We live in an era when people are calling the Bible false and man's wisdom true. We live in a culture that's telling us that, you know what, God's Word is just some old antiquated book. And isn't it interesting, there stood Pilate in front of Jesus and he said, what is truth? You know, if you're in John, if you happen to be there, go to John chapter 17 for just a minute. There's a great verse in John 17 in the high priestly prayer of Jesus that if you're not familiar with this verse, you need to be. In one of my old Bibles, I used to have it underlined and starred, and I don't have that in this particular copy of my scriptures, but if you're not familiar with it, maybe you ought to do that. John 17, verse 17, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Propositional truth. Your word is truth. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, I think verse 21, it's true. You will never be led astray by God's word. It will never lie to you. It will never tell you something that isn't true. And there stood Pilate asking the question, what is truth? 
the propositional truth of God's Word. That's why we spend our life studying it. That's why you need to spend your life pouring into this book. We will never exhaust it. We'll never get it all down. And it's the only truth that the world really needs. Don't misunderstand me. There's a lot of true things that aren't necessarily found in the Bible. It's true a hundred years ago the Titanic sank. I won't find that in the Bible. I mean, there's a lot of things that are true that aren't necessarily found in the Bible, but what you find in the Bible is true. There was a man named Adam. There was a woman named Eve. They lived on a place called, uh, in a place called the Garden of Eden. There was a flood that covered the entire world to the highest mountain. There was a na man named Abraham who lived in a place called the Ur of the Chaldees. There was a man named Noah who led people out of Egypt. I mean, it's true. It's true. It's also true that man fell into sin, Genesis 3, and that our problem is all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's true that there's a place called heaven, and it's true that there's a place called hell. The Word of God is propositional truth. And our job is not to be a critic of that truth. Our job is to read it, believe it, and obey it. I think I've said to you before, but there are times when you, you're in Bible college and seminary long enough that you, um, you kind of get to the place where you think that the Bible is a book of questions. It was about 10 years into my ministry when I began to really get a clarified version of the fact that the Bible isn't a book of questions, it's a book of answers. You and I need to go into the world into which we live and present to them the truth. Pilate said, what is truth? Not only did Jesus talk about all the fact of propositional truth, in John 14 he said, I am the way the truth. He's the ultimate truth. Roy and Nancy are here from Spain and they'll tell you that they told us this morning in Sunday school and they'll tell us again tonight that they live in a culture in which there's a lot of religious thought. The Roman Catholic Church has a has a real strong hold still on people. Although the reality is most of them are as he read for us this morning, they're ignorant of God's righteousness. See, we live in a culture in America where we kind of think that people know what they need to know and they don't. See, they're asking that question, well, what is truth? There are people who will dabble a little bit in this religion and dabble a little bit in that religion and try something else and try something else. They sort of go to this little smorgasbord and, and they're never satisfied. They're asking Pilate's question, what is truth? And truth is found in the person of Jesus Christ. That, that's where truth is found. And you and I need to be willing to go to them and say, there's only one place that truth is truly found and that's in Jesus. Pilate understood the truth of one thing, that Jesus was innocent. I, I mean, again, you, you can go to Luke's Gospel. I think it's five times in Luke's Gospel. It's recorded. Pilate said, I find no fault. He's not guilty. And yet, even though he knew the truth, he didn't, he didn't act on it. He gave in to the crowds. He released Barabbas. You know, I want you to look at chapter 19 for just a minute because there's another famous thing that Pilate said. And I want you to think with me about it this morning if you would. We're going to get into the actual crucifixion in the days that lie ahead, but if you read in chapter 19 of John, in verse 5, then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said unto him, Behold the man. 
I don't know about you, but there are times when I read anything, a book of any kind, but certainly when I read the scriptures, oh, how I wish I had had a, 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 um, a tape recording so I could hear how something was said. Do you ever wonder that? See, did he say, behold, the man? Or did he say, behold, the man? Or did he say, behold, the man? Kind of makes a difference in how, where you put the emphasis. I mean, there are some times in the scripture that, depending on the, like how the sentence structure is in the original, you can kind of see how it's emphasized. But there are so many times when I just wish I could have heard Pilate say it, like there was, like I say, some kind of a recording, but there isn't, obviously. So I'm not exactly sure how Pilate said it, but I have this sense that when he brought him out, he had already beaten him, and we'll see some of that in the days that lie ahead, but he had already scourged him and beaten him. He was already bloodied. He, he had his back um, torn apart, and he had the crown of thorns on and all of that, and yet he brought him out and he said, Hey, look, the man. I want you to look at that man with me this morning and I want you to look at this person, the Lord Jesus Christ, from a number of different angles. Go with me to John chapter 1 if you would and let's look at him as he's described in John chapter 1. <coughs> Excuse me. In John chapter 1, you probably know the verse, but look at it in verse 29. John the Baptist came along, and in John 1, 29, the next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Down at verse 36, he said it again, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. This morning when you think about Jesus, this morning if you would behold the man this morning, as you think of him standing there in front of that crowd, as Pilate would have said, Eke homo, look at the man. He stood there as the Lamb of God, the beloved Son of God. He stood there as the one who would bear the sin of man. Behold the man. Again, this morning we sang songs about the cross and we and we're reminded of that of that from our perspective that 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 awful experience that Jesus had to go through for for us to receive salvation. And John had said it at the beginning of his ministry, behold the Lamb of God. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 5. Again, same author, of course, John. And in Revelation chapter 5, he's presented, interestingly enough, in two ways. Look at it in Revelation 5 and verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, Don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes and there were the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Isn't it interesting? The words lion of the tribe of Judah and the lamb are used in the same context. See, because I think it goes back again to that reality. Jesus isn't only the lamb, he's also the lion. He's not only just the, he's not only the Savior, he is the Sovereign. Behold the man, there he stood. Beginning to walk that path in a very practical way for your salvation and mine. Again, John says it five times in this context, the man. I'll go back to John, if you would, in chapter 19. Again, there's another little phrase that I want you to notice about beholding. Look at John chapter 19 and verse 14. John 19, 14 said, And now the preparation day of the Passover, at about the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. Ah, behold your king. 
You think he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. You think he's your sovereign. You think he is Messiah. At least that's what he claimed to be and others would claim him to be. Behold your king. Look what I've done. See, if we could have talked to Pilate that day, he would have said it was through his power that he was handed over for crucifixion. If you had talked to the Jews that day, they would have said it was their power. In fact, is that not what they said to Pilate? Look, don't worry about it, Pilate. You can wash your hands of the guilt if you want because we'll take his blood on our hands. So he said, behold, your king. The world still thinks they have victory over Jesus. Really. You know, you, you look at the world and you listen to them and you would think that there's nothing to worry about into eternity. You would think that we can just live our lives and do whatever we want and it doesn't matter because, kind of like Pilate, look what we've done to your king. But even though he stood there appearing at least to be having been defeated they didn't realize that it was through that very act that he would defeat Satan continue reading in chapter 19 if you would one of the sayings from the cross at verse 26 when Jesus therefore saw his mother and disciple whom he loved standing beside him he said to his mother woman behold your son and he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. Most likely he was, he was referring to John, so he was saying to his mother, <coughs> Mom, look, John now will become your son. He will take my place. He will take the responsibility of, of, taking, uh, of, of walking beside you since I'll be gone. And he said to John, Behold your mother. And I think he was referring to Mary, but I also think the... The phrase Jesus spoke from the cross was, Mom, look at me. You remember all the way back when the angels came to announce his birth to Mary, and then as his life progressed, Mary said, these were things that she kept in her heart. I mean, is there anything worse for you as a mother? Is there really anything worse for you than to see your children hurt? I think it's the same thing for us as fathers. I, I, you know, I, there were very few times where I wouldn't have stood up for my kids. I mean, somebody started to hurt my kid, you can be assured I'd stand up. I made a few phone calls in my day to, um, to officials who I thought were mistreating my kids. It was hard sometimes to be watching a basketball game or a soccer game when I thought my kid was being um, abused. Well, in fact, there were times at basketball where I told those guys in the striped shirts abusing my kids that they were wrong. But, um, and um, so it's hard to watch your kids be hurt. I can't imagine what it must have been like for Mary to have stood at the foot of the cross of her own son being killed between two thieves and he said, Mom, behold your son. Can you see him? Pilate brought him out in a mocking way just to, just to demonstrate what he thought was his authority over Jesus. Oh, behold the man. But John the Baptist had said four years earlier, behold this, the Lamb of God. John tells us in the book of the Revelation that years ahead he will be declared as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Pilate said, behold your king. Jesus said, Behold your son. So what I want you to think about this morning before you leave this place is really, is he your savior? Have you ever come to the cross? Now I think I know most of you this morning. I look around and I recognize that we're pretty much, you know, well known to one another, but you know what? I would still never take it for granted that you're not here this morning and you've really never genuinely come to the cross. Oh, your head might be full of all kinds of knowledge and understanding and you might know something about the truth, but you really don't know the one who is true. 
Pilate stood there with the opportunity to release Jesus, and he wouldn't do it. Sometimes we're just so afraid of what others will think. When I had jotted down for myself, I mean, ever since Genesis 3, he had been prophesied to become the coming Messiah. We have looked through the whole gospel of Mark up to this point over these last few years, and again, we've seen his life, now we're seeing his death. Last week was Easter, we celebrated his resurrection. Eventually in Acts 1, we see his ascension. We look forward to his coming. I mean, the whole point is, is that Jesus should be the central focus of, of our life. The sinless, perfect Son of God. Pilate said it, behold the man. Well, as the case went on, of course it came to the end of the case and back to Mark 15, but when it came all the way down to the end, Pilate had just said, forget it, just take him and beat him. Just beat him up, maybe they'll think that that's enough. Let me read you a little, a little statement by one author that said this, the scourging was a brutal affair. Stripped of clothes, the victim was forced to bend over a low pillar, while a short-handled whip with several leather thongs studded with sharp objects was used to lash and lacerate the back. Listen, Roman law laid no limits on the number of blows to be administered. Such scourgings were sometimes fatal. You know, sometimes we remember that little phrase, you know, 39 save one and 40 save one, excuse me, or 39 lashes. And we realize that in the, to the Jewish law, there was a law that said you could not beat a man past 39 times. And, but that wasn't Roman law. How many times did they beat him? How, how brutal was that beating? Well, it was brutal enough that he began to lose his blood. He began to suffer the, <coughs> the wickedness and the pain of man all the while knowing that it was for our sins. I mean, he was innocent. Behold the man. Think about the love of God for you and for me. I mean, again, it, it, these are such familiar stories and accounts. I mean, they are such familiar things and we, we, we run the risk of just forgetting what Jesus did for us. As we close, I, I want you to stop and say, Lord, you have saved me from that punishment. Your son took your wrath for me. And I trust that you will be so thankful for that. And if you're here without Christ, would you consider the fact that he wants you to trust him as your Lord and Savior? And if you're here this morning without Jesus Christ, before you leave this service today, that is our prayer, that you will personally receive him as your Lord and Savior. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning we're going to close and I thank you so much for the fact that your son stood before all these humans who thought they had power over him, all the while knowing that he was in control. And I thank you that, that your son went all the way to the cross for us. And I thank you that in your perfect plan, it was designed for us as lost sinners to come to Christ to receive the work on the cross. Maybe there's someone here, Lord, that has never trusted your son as their savior. And I would pray that even today you would work in their heart, convict them of their sin, bring them to the place of confession of your son to be their Lord and savior. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.